Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining today um, in the first virtual or second day of the first uh, virtual DART conference. Uh, my name is Vinod, and I'm going to share some ideas on how we can index research. Um, it's always intimidating to talk after a very good talk by Chris. Um, thanks for the excellent work uh, the team of Liberate Sci have been doing. Um, and uh, here, uh, this is not going to be technical and this is not a finished product. This is just uh, going to be a session or moderated session on idea generation. Uh, more on things that I've been passionate and things that I would love to work for the next few years uh, in order to change certain ideas. Um, so with that, um, I would jump into the next slide. Well, I think I need to switch something. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, remind you quickly uh, to uh, comply with the code of conduct um, and uh, kindly do not attack, demean, disrupt, harass, or threaten others or encourage such behavior. Uh, and if there is need, please report to Diego or Nina. And the organizers reserve the right to ask anyone to leave or to deny uh, subsequent access to the sessions. And uh, quickly, the agenda of my um, session or uh, the plan that I initially had was to have a short introduction and overview of uh, the ideas that I wanted to share and wanted to generate a small discussion group uh, where I think we'll go into a breakout room or interactive session, however we would like to call it as. And then we would report um, uh, things that were discussed there and uh, then quickly wrap up by um, you know, collecting ideas and then moving on to the next steps. Um, Although it was initially planned for a 90 minute session, I planned for around 60 minutes. Um, so as to give some planning for everyone who's joining. And uh, then I would kind of wait around for a drop in session where if there are more ideas and questions, I'll be happy to take them. And uh, before we begin, I just wanted to give a quick introduction to my own self. Uh, my name is Vinod and I consider myself a status with consciousness. And what that means is uh, just that I am multidimensional, which is I'm trained as a scientist, but that is not what all I am. Uh, I use art in order to communicate science, and uh, I'm very intersectional, I'm, I'm queer. Uh, my pronouns are uh, they, them, uh, but I, if you uh, refer me by the pronouns he, him, I still would be comfortable. And um, I was born in India, and I uh, got trained um, in uh, Europe uh, in uh, very um, privileged institutions. So these are privileges that I bring with, uh, but there are also certain underprivileges that I have uh, in navigating academic structures. And that is one of the reasons why I wanted to um, you know, kind of bring forth the idea of intersectional lens and also uh, share decolonized values and how we can improve science. Uh, because currently science is a very colonial or imperialistic uh, enterprise. Uh, that is operating, which needs to change for the good of all or good of the planet, if you would like to call it. Um, and uh, if you want to change that, then we need to change it in the ways that it needs to be uh, decolonized at different levels. Um, before we delve into uh, the whole discussion, I just wanted to set the uh, stage uh, clear so that everyone is on the same page. Um, uh, things about uh, equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, so we always talk about equality, but equality and equity differs. Equity is providing access to a certain group of people that is called as the affirmative actions or marginalized people need to be uh, treated better in order to achieve the same goals or similar goals um, in, in, the, in the given environment or the context. Uh, diversity is something that exists in the world and as a biologist uh, or being trained as a biologist, I appreciate that diversity exists, but inclusion is something that can only functionally work when diversity is put together in a functional framework rather than just talking about, oh yeah, diversity exists and just acknowledging that, but uh, by including that diversity into every framework of how we function and how we work and how we share information and how we share knowledge. Uh, to set everyone on the same page about uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, so equity is something that, uh, you know, structurally uh, or uh, 
you know, uh, through the mechanisms that we have, we need to provide certain opportunities that are not really equal to marginalized groups in order to bring them under the equal footage of how they can achieve certain things and how they can achieve the goals in an equitable manner. Um, and diversity is something that exists and we need to put diversity or acknowledge diversity by uh, providing frameworks where functionally things can interact and um, um, you know, collaborate with you know, differences, respecting differences and so on. Uh, so that is what I wanted to share uh, before we delve into um, you know, further topic. Um, so at this moment, um, I'd like to say something about how the new knowledge or new information is shared currently or the current state of the art that we have. Uh, when we are challenged by certain situations, um, we engage with that challenging situation and then we search. For example, COVID-19 as an example. Uh, everyone started talking about it and some people were engaging with it. Many people were ignoring it. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe I should maybe use a joke in order to bring everyone that uh, whatever clothes you wear is your choice, but remember to wear a mask. Um, and some people engage with that challenge and then they search for information and then from the search they integrate the new knowledge that they've got or the existing knowledge that they've got and explore further and some people go to the extent of generating new information through experiments through hypotheses and what you know all, all the whole research life cycle process they generate new ideas um, or generate new theories and validate them and that becomes uh, evidence-based medicine or science or however we would like to call them as. And um, that is then shared. And that's when the problem comes. When we share, there is not an equitable platform for sharing. And that is what you know, Chris has been also talking about previously, where uh, there is not enough um, equitable uh, platforms to share at different stages of the research life, cy life cycle. And uh, when it comes uh, to validation, then validation happens at the final stage where you can't go back and change in most cases. And uh, that needs to dynamically change. Uh, and this validation also has an element of who validates it. Uh, because as, as a person who's trained in academia, I, I validate certain kind of information. And I can only validate certain kind of information because that is my expertise. And there are some things like testimonial evidence and um, you know, there are a lot of things that we do not currently uh, consider as valid knowledge. Um, and that brings to who can be legitimately be the knowledge gatekeeper or you know, who can protect how knowledge is shared or who can say that is what is the correct knowledge and so on. Um, and that process needs to democratize. And once we have the validated information, then that needs to be reused by, again, you know, when a challenging situation arises, then some people engage with that. And then that is again reused in certain contexts in order to generate further new knowledge. And all of that needs to be indexed and curated. And right now we do not have a one centralized platform or even decentralized platform in order to curate that. So my idea was to, um, you know, create a platform where we, uh, ideally capture all of that, the, the whole process of how new knowledge or new information is generated, and um, also use that in the current traditional context in order to reform what is already existing, uh, which will take a long, long time, uh, but at least we need to think about how we can change certain things in a very decentralized way. Um, and uh, this is not going to be very technical, this is just going to be um, more like a brainstorming session rather than uh, um, yeah, um, rather than something that is going to be very technical. Um, so for the next slide, um, I just wanted to emphasize, uh, wanted to now say that, okay, dude, um, what is the problem now? You could use things like Google Scholar or Microsoft Academic or, I don't know, PubMed or something like that. Uh, the problem with the current state of art of curating or search engines, or if you would want to even call them as indexing services, uh, they have very poor search optimization. For example, if you search for an author uh, whose name is probably Beans and then search for PDF files, then you get something like lunch menu of some senior high school um, that has Beans in it. Um, and then most of the indexing services are not peer-to-peer -peer and they are very top-down. And uh, the additional problems exist on you know, the things like what I, what I spoke about, um, 
it excludes certain forms of knowledge. It only includes the very text-based knowledge or very text-based uh, peer-reviewed journals. And even within the journals, only the select journals are inside uh, the curated or indexed uh, services. And uh, several research communities within themselves are excluded. And then, then you could also bring in the idea of how indigenous communities knowledge is completely excluded from that and so on. And apart from that, language acts as a larger barrier where um, you know, most of the research outputs are in English. And I don't mean to say that everyone has to produce in their own language in order to complicate everything, because language is supposed to be used as a communication tool rather than as a barrier for participation. Um, so with the advent of technology and the current technology that we have, it is possible to translate certain types of outputs in order to really engage with them in a very meaningful way. And there's also a large power imbalance in how knowledge is validated, which I already touched upon, that um, you know, academia acts as a gatekeeper of knowledge where they say that, oh, just because three anonymous peer reviews peer reviewed it, it must be true. And then you could inject yourself with Lysol or inject or take hydroxychloroquine and so on. And then, then people report that there are several problems with such studies that have been performed and which has been very shortly peer reviewed in a very short amount of time and so on. Um, so this power imbalance in how the knowledge or how, or how certain research reports are validated, again, brings to the Bring, you know, brings to the thought that we need to have a better system. And how would we have that better system? So that is what I'm going to ask you to do uh, a short brainstorming of how we can change that. So we'll have a small breakout session um, and um, I'll probably kindly ask um, Martin to keep the time um, uh, uh, for me. And um, the questions that we would kind of discuss in the in the short or small breakout rooms would be, uh, is knowledge curated inclusively? And what can we do better in the future? And if you have other thoughts, you could also bring that. Uh, whatever we would do in the breakout room is uh, very personal. You could share your thoughts there. And uh, you don't need to share that anywhere else if you feel uncomfortable. Uh, but if you are comfortable, um, I'd love to hear more of your curated thoughts from the group discussion. Um, and there are some guidelines that I created for uh, the group discussion. Uh, please follow the code of conduct of the uh, conference. And um, yeah, when you go into the breakout room to break the silence, kindly introduce yourself. Uh, you could use your name, affiliation, pronouns, uh, or even location if you're comfortable sharing that, or other fun fact if you could. Um, and you could find one day among the group to chat the discussion um, so that everyone has opportunity to speak and share their ideas. And also you could choose another volunteer to report the discussion from that discussion group back to the main room. Um, this could be the same person, but it doesn't necessarily need to be. So you could, um, that could be different people are doing different roles of charting um, so that everyone gets opportunity to speak and then the other person captures the notes or captures the ideas and shares back in the main room. Uh, so with that, uh, we could go to the breakout session. Uh, where, yeah, we discuss the questions, is knowledge curated inclusively, and what can we do better in the future? Or if you have other thoughts, uh, I'd love to hear them. Uh, or we all would uh, love to, uh, yeah, discuss upon that. Uh, so now I'll stop sharing my screen, and then I let's go into the, the video breakout. stream for the next 10 minutes. Yeah. which is on the reporting out of the breakout session. So I'll just quickly read uh, some of the comments that have been posted. Um, so Jeremy uh, says that uh, for them, emphasis in 2020 has been on aiming to archive and provide technical support as um, to essential coronavirus initiatives as possible and to do a tech DIY bio. Uh, that's wonderful. Um, and uh, well, yeah, so we could probably continue thinking about that uh, in the way how we can make um, spaces inclusive, not just spaces inclusive, but uh, you know, the technology that we produce uh, inclusive where people, other people could, uh, people with other perspectives could participate and so on. 
and then moving on, uh, so this was my small idea, which uh, was also, uh, you know, there was a lot of brainstorming and idea generation or ideation process that happened through the Mozilla Open Leader Fellow Program, and I'm thankful to, to the Mozilla community for that. Um, and um, so we clearly identified there's a need for inclusive indexing. I mean, I'm trying to talk about indexing in particular, but there, there needs to be every other space within technology or within that community needs to be more inclusive and um, and some of the most inclusive efforts need to be also applauded um, and by saying that I just uh, want to switch gears and say um, my interest is on curating or indexing the current state of art of knowledge that we have um, and what we currently require is a community owned and community curated indexing or curation platform and uh, those should be able to capture all persistent identifiers to start with. For example, things that has DOI need to be captured. So that would include uh, things like uh, journal articles, um, because preprints have been excluded completely because they've been engaged, but they've been excluded in certain ways. Uh, so th those need to come into the curation process or indexing process. Um, and uh, when we have such outputs, which are very large and you know, it's, it's again an information overload and that needs to have certain context. Um, there are some of the currently available platforms, for example, Microsoft Academic uh, provides certain context in, you know, into the whole uh, key area of the research and so on. Uh, so something similar could be practiced in order to contextualize, uh, contextualize information. Um, but what is missing in the current uh, or the available platforms or, you know, the platforms that are available publicly um, are that there is no clear indication whether certain type of information has been retracted or certain type of information has been unscientific or that is something that one should not engage with further on um, or something that is that one should engage with more or something like that. So that is something that we are missing currently. And those kind of, um, I don't know, granular layer need to be built into such kind of community owned uh, indexing database. And um, most of the indexing databases um, or the, most of the search engine optimizations uh, are not very good uh, currently. Uh, even the best ones that we have um, have the problems uh, which I uh, which I'll quickly show you in the previous slides that I uh, tried to make, uh, which is um, when you search for, as, uh, as a previous example that I told, when you search for um, uh, author whose name is Beans, and then you search for PDF kind of document, then you also get lunch menu. Um, and that is not really um, great if you want to build upon some really interesting and cool initiatives, which is even necessary for things like pandemic emergencies. Um, so that needs to be increased, and that can be increased only by uh, having a community effort uh, or peer to peer effort rather than a top down approach. Um, one other thing that we don't uh, usually consider is a um, real case for both machine operability and translation and also human readability. Um, so how could one engage with that database? Because currently when, when certain journals are indexed in, let's say PubMed or certain types of services, certain type of indexing services owned by private or for-profit uh, publishers, uh, they then use that in order to validate those again. So they don't just validate the information in that, but they use that information in order to create certain metrics that doesn't make any sense. And that creates a whole problem of who gets the grant and who gets to do certain type of work and so on. So that needs to change. And um, probably we need to allow more machine readability or machine operability, operability in order to engage with certain types of content and to really scan through what a human eye couldn't do and then use human users in order to really validate whether that machine processes have um, done the things in a better way. And uh, there are several things that I am blinded to because I come from certain experience and that is one of the reasons why I even want to open this floor in order to uh, get further ideas on how we can create an inclusive indexing database uh, or inclusive indexing um, system uh, in order to capture all the available outputs. Um, also, the, in Chris's talk, um, they also mentioned um, there is only the text type of information is what is currently present as, as, a, as a research output. And 
that is currently changing. For example, there are a lot of video content that is produced, particularly during this pandemic time. And uh, you know, in a day of 24 hours, uh, even if you take within a small niche community of uh, behavioral neuroscience, there's 40 hours of content that is produced. And I don't know how humans are going to engage with that because these are all valuable content produced by several group of humans. Uh, and that work shouldn't be undermined and needs to be engaged in a very meaningful way. Uh, on top of it, um, video contents have a uh, value to the whole of non-scientific community or the non-experts, let's say. Like everyone would be a do-it-yourself citizen scientist, but uh, when there is specialized knowledge that exists and that can be translated into assimilatable form of smaller videos, and whether those videos make sense in the scientific information or whether those follow certain scientific guidelines, or whether they talk about scientific information, because there's a lot of misinformation currently, and that needs to be, that can only be overcome when we have an inclusive and community-owned database that can um, very uh, meaningfully curate information and give it back to the community in order for the whole of the 21st century, or, or the post-millennials, let's say, uh, for them uh, to engage with the world around us. Um, because it's going to be very highly uh, complex in order to complex and vulnerable in order to navigate uh, an information overload. And on top of that information overload, if you have uh, emergency situations like pandemic or even maybe there's going to be some global uh, climate emergency, uh, if all of that comes, how would we deal with that um, with the available information? And um, what can we do about it? And those are those are things that I currently consider for other considerations, but there might be things that I'm not aware of, and I would like to hear um, those things from you. Uh, so I would now stop that and um, let others speak uh, for the next five minutes. Um, okay. Let me know either in the chat or in the, yeah, if you would like to speak up, um, you could speak up. Um, I'll just wait for a few more minutes um, and not take too much of the time okay. and hopefully finish it. Uh, on schedule. Jeremy Cahill, SIG year 2020. Is that a conference? Yes, it's the uh, information retrieval SIG. What, what, uh, what was there? So when I hear about this, of course, contextualizing the content, uh, I'm just speaking. Um, I'm thinking of uh, search engines in user chat in Japan. So on the vast majority, just sharing here my, my thoughts, on the vast majority of open source uh, chat systems that we tried, the indexing for uh, Japanese uh, text is not good. So you cannot search for Japanese text input. And uh, that means a lot of the open source um, text systems don't work. Now, the problem is, a lot, a lot of those problems are a lack of visibility, which is to say, if you have, if you are a Japanese company and you're trying out systems, you are already uh, putting in the double effort because you have to look at the documentation, everything in English. And when you then start to make it run, you need to test it out for, for Japanese text and then it breaks. And so that is already a lot of effort. And then you get into that position where you have to report in English uh, your problems of Japanese that are not given. So uh, if there was an effort by someone to to write like uh, uh, language specific tests for these sort of systems that people can just apply, or if there's like a you know uh, uh, all type um, chat test, for example, like where you can say okay. Does this chat meet the uh, inclusivity criteria? Does this open source software fun function for 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 uh, like say lang language diverse communities? That is something that might be interesting to have. I mean, the the developers they don't know about this. You know that they they're just, they're unaware of it, or it's actually hard and they need effort for this. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that. And uh, there was also uh, another point mentioned earlier by uh, Junkan. Um, so uh, it seems to them that the access to knowledge is also tied to being a confident user of technology, which I uh, completely agree with, or even having access to internet at all. 
Um, so yeah, so that's, that is again an exclusive one, but uh, we operate on the premise that uh, at least for those who are able to engage with technology, um, should be able to have certain inclusiveness and you know things like uh, language specific communities and uh, th these are all existing as individual entities but there is not really an aggregator phenomenon of you know to really link them um, maybe i think that is also an interesting point uh, you know I'm, I'm floating around ideas that somebody could take take up um, and um, yeah, Johan says um, that's uh, very interesting and they don't have any experience in the scientific community, um, unfortunately, nor know anything about indexing, uh, but they try to curate interesting hyperdrives and provide links to um, a beaker app where uh, TFPy fall. Um, so I think that looks like an interesting idea where um, you curate certain interesting things in a very decentralized way. And that is something that I'm also um, looking forward for um, you know, uh, you know, some indigenous communities can curate that in a decentralized way, and that needs to get into an aggregator platform. And that aggregator platform is where, if you want to do in-depth analysis on, let's say, I would like to study um, potato plants or different varieties of potatoes in South America. So then you could, you know, the knowledge curated by the indigenous communities are very essential in that sense because. They have only seen one kind of potatoes, and you know potatoes are very recent in the Western or the global North, um, relatively recent. Um, so, if people can actually adapt to eat and make modify their diet into potato, uh, why not modify things like bringing inclusivity into uh, into uh, you know things that we work on, for example, technology. And uh, Jeremy also posted some uh, micro collections about uh, something which is which looks exciting, and I would like to copy them all uh, later for a future discussion. Um, and uh, with that, uh, the next step that I wanted to actually talk is about um, you know we talk about things being exclusive and uh, things being um, not very uh, helpful for many folks, uh, and that is. That brings again to the inclusive issue or being again exclusive uh, where the communities don't interact with each other. For example, the developer communities don't interact with those who the user community and uh, these two communities do not interact with the elite scientific community. And um, for that, I would like to think about, you know, because I'm trying to assign this again, I have this blind spot. Um, so I try to think about generating a white paper on what is necessary and what is needed and like every everyone who's interested can participate or you know collaborate and um, share their ideas um, if uh, that brings in um, that would be interesting to have um, you know ideas generated and directed at scientific community and uh, there needs to be some way to also reach out to you know different communities that find this useful and they could also contribute not into a static white paper or I call it as white paper because that's how it's called but not as a static document but that is something dynamically changing with contributions from different ends um, for which I would probably use hypergraph uh, uh, ideally uh, because I've been one of the early uh, testers of hypergraph uh, and um, I saw that there's a value in using that uh, for such kind of uh, you know, knowledge production work. And uh, Johan also posted something with the indexing uh, uh, link. Um, uh, thanks a lot for that. Um, and uh, I'm more or less coming close to the end of uh, what I've planned uh, for the next, uh, yeah, 40, like the first 60 minutes of it. Um, I would uh, stop there and thank everyone for uh, sharing all your wonderful ideas. Um, and I'll open up the floor for more questions, um, actions, thoughts, or ideas that you have. Um, and I'll, I'll be here uh, for the drop-in session, but you could also use this for your bio break. Um, take a break, uh, uh, drink some water, and uh, get ready for the next session. Uh, thank you everyone for participating in the very engaged discussion. Yeah, as a organizer, we are very happy that you're here and uh, we would really love to um, get more of this going in the conference. By the way, this is my family in the background. 
<laughs> Sorry for that. Um, so uh, last thoughts, of course, um, from my, our side is, if you want, we can have this um, conversation going on in the chat. Uh, if you want, we have we can have this conversation going on in the dot com com uh, weekly meetings, and uh, uh, you are all welcome to join. Everybody is. Um, if you have anything that we can improve, let us know. Uh, and uh, yeah. Um, I hope we can we can make like some progress in the next year, for uh, and share that yeah. in the next that conference maybe. Yeah, hopefully I would also make some progress in the technical side of it, and then maybe there will be some product that I can then share and do some demo. Hopefully, um, for that I would uh, like to uh, thank again Martin for uh, moderating the session and helping me out uh, with a uh, lot of technical snacks and uh, all the organizing team of uh, DAP Conference and the DAP Foundation for uh, putting this wonderful program. Uh, and everyone who had joined in today at different times of the whole globe uh, to jump in and provide your uh, constructive uh, feedback and your perspective. Uh, that's really uh, helpful. Um, so I, um, I'm reachable on Twitter if people are comfortable uh, doing so. I could just uh, post my uh, Twitter link in there uh, if people would like to um, yeah, uh, get in touch with me um, for further ideas and how to make progress from this point. Um, and uh, as I already mentioned, I do not have the technical expertise. Um, and this again is a volunteer ask that I'm asking. Uh, if you have some ideas, um, I'd be happy to uh, hear more from you. Um, and I would, I'm also currently thinking uh, ways on how volunteer participation can be recognized at, at some level at, at some time in the future. Um, but uh, currently, yeah, it's, it's a very volunteer uh, thing that's going to yeah, happen uh, if you'd like to engage. Uh, and uh, nevertheless, I'd like to hear uh, more thoughts from you. Uh, with that, then I would thank everyone for uh, keeping the chat very, very uh, lively.